It's Connections Radio. Nice to have your company today. Paul, we have on the phone via our Skype connection a very special guest based in Ireland, I do believe. We do indeed. We have uh, Mr. John McCulloch. John, welcome. Hello. John is uh, a small business advocate and the author of uh, Grow Your Business Fast and known as the Evil Ball Genius. Is that right, John? That's absolutely correct, yes. I'm looking at your website now and uh, yes, I'd, I wouldn't want to meet you in a dark alley. Put it that way. <laughs> I'm perfectly safe unless you're trying to attack me or something. No, no, no. I used to work as a nightclub doorman, and my appearance was uh, quite beneficial, especially as I'm only five foot five. <laughs> well, as you say, John, it's not your height or good looks and charm that have got you to where you are. So, absolutely not, <laughs> John. What we would like to focus on in our interview with you today is how small businesses should look at their pricing policy and how to consider how premium pricing is the way forward and not to get involved in competing on price can you give us some some sound advice on that please oh absolutely i mean i did a a two-day event last summer on premium pricing and positioning i did a whole day on pricing so i've got lots to say on it the thing is with with low pricing and let's let's tackle the 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 no-no first um there's not a single instance of a a low cost discount budget business surviving more than a few years and uh, you might say that's incorrect because you can look at people like Ryanair and Tesco and Asda and a lot of these low-cost supermarkets and other businesses but if you look into what they're actually doing for instance Ryanair make their money on premium add-ons plus um, they sting the airports they get airports to pay them to take their planes there because they're delivering passengers to the airports Asda and the other supermarkets they have premium ranges of their own stuff which ameliorate the losses they make on their low-cost stuff. Um, and most local businesses don't actually understand that, and, and they can't do it either. So competing on price is insane because it has nothing, nothing, to say, nothing good to say about it at all because you make low profits, you get the worst kind of customers and clients, you are working harder and harder and harder for less and less reward all the time. I mean, a good example, I mean, I, I can show people with a mass if they want to see it, but... On a 35% markup, a small 10% price decrease, discount if you like, will slash into your profits by 40%. And I often walk down the high street and see, you know, 20%, 30%, 50%, 75% off. Well, these people are basically working, well, if, if, you, if, you work, if you're not making any profit, you're working for nothing. If you're working at a loss, um, you're working, you're paying to go to work. And when people cut prices and get into price wars, all that happens is the competitors will follow suit. So everyone is then back in the same boat because customers just shuffle around a bit. You don't gain any more business by it. You just, you just lose a few, gain a few. And everyone is then working harder for less and less money. Well, we, then you're not satisfied because you're not making any money. You cannot possibly satisfy your clients because you can't give them the time and attention they deserve. It's, it's like a cliche. You've got three things. You've got premium quality, you've got premium service, and you've got... Um, a low price. You can have any two of those, but you can't have all three. Most businesses, they think they can provide all three, and they just bloody well can't. So that's low pricing. Now, with high pricing, premium pricing, everything gets easier. Um, You get a better class of client. And I know that's very non-PC to say, but you do. You don't get the chavs and the peasants and the commoners. You get people who are more committed to what solution you offer, whatever it is. Glenn's Um, nodding, by the way, John. He recognised one of those descriptions to himself. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But you do. You you get a better class of customer. You can spend more time serving them, finding out what their problem actually is. Mm, So then you can serve them. And because you're making more money per client, it doesn't matter if you turn a few away because you're making loads of more money elsewhere. Okay. So you, you don't feel this need because with low cost selling, low price selling, you're so short of money, mm. you'll take anything that comes. Whereas with higher price selling, premium selling, you don't. You can pick and choose. Well, that benefits you and the customer as well with the client. I use the two interchangeably because I, I tend to use the traditional meaning of the word client, which is somebody under your special protection. You know, that goes back to the Romans and the Greeks. So it's deliberate. But the problem with premium pricing, well, that, that isn't the problem, but the perceived problem with premium pricing is business owners fear probably three things for the most part. The first is they fear people actually being price buyers. They fear people walking around thinking, I'm not going to pay a high price. I want the cheapest thing I can get. Well, that might be true in some instances with some people some of the time. Okay, none of us want to go out and spend more on insurance than we need to. 
or more on carpet cleaning than we need to. Mm. And they are grudge purchases. But even they can be changed. The perception of those can be changed. Sure. But most of us, we will not buy the cheapest thing possible because if that was the case, we'd all be shopping at yeah. Primark. John? We'd all be driving, driving around in cheap cars. Absolutely. Can yeah. I come in on that? Because some very, yeah. very interesting points here. So, first of all, there is no bridge between going from discount pricing to premium pricing. You're not going to be able to go up that ladder into premium pricing, I, I believe. Is that right? From a discount policy. I suppose you can, if you wish, get people in as lost leaders and nurture them and, and into the higher end offering. I suppose you can, yeah. Because among all the dross, you'll get some diamonds, of course. Is that what you mean? What I mean is the perception of you as a business, if you are on a discount structure, that's how people perceive you, to then actually make a switch to change your, your strategy and, and profile to a premium-led business. That must take a lot of time, and probably it's too late to do that. No, absolutely not. You can do it overnight if you wish. Okay. Uh, and there's no danger in doing so. I'll give you an example. If a lawyer suddenly starts, say they're a discount lawyer, they're, they're going in the cheapest they can. If they suddenly raise their fees and stop talking about we won't be beaten on price and things like that, well, the, the fees will, have, will rise overnight. I tell people, one of the first things I tell people to do is increase your prices by 10% at least. Because on the same 35% markup I mentioned earlier, that gives people a 40% increase in their profits. People yeah. can and should raise their prices immediately. I mean, unless you've got one of these stupid pound stores where everything's under a pound, in which case you're, you should be sectioned or something because you're insane. There's not a business out there that cannot increase their prices. Okay, that's and what stops them? What, how, why can't what, they? Yeah, why can't they? There's no, no rule there at all. So, John, what would your advice be? I mean, it's good for the consumer, all these slashed prices. I mean, I'm talking about there's a furniture shop on, on television that advertises. There's a continual sale. They have a winter I, sale, a spring sale. Can I sale. stop you there? Yeah, sure. I don't think it is good for the consumer at all. Okay, why? Well, okay, i um, give you an example just had the lenses in my eyes replaced surgically i've got cataracts so they, i went into the operating theater they two s subsequent days they slashed my eyes open and took the lens out and put a new one in took about 20 minutes i've now got 20 20 vision distance vision and better than 20 20 close up now would it have been to my benefit rather than paying for the 5000 euro which was actually too cheap i thought would it have been any benefit to me to pay the surgeon 50 euro where he would have been rushed because he's got to work 100 times as hard to make the same amount of money. Mm. He cannot lavish the same expense on his equipment and his operating theatre and his staff and his promotion and all the rest of the, the follow-up. Would it be better to have budget eye surgery or would it be better to pay a little bit more and get quality? So would that be the same for furniture then? It would be the same for everything. I mean, if you want to cater to the masses who want cheap furniture, then fine, be my guest. But wouldn't you rather be selling premium hand-carved oak furniture for 10 to 100 times more and dealing with a better class of person and getting far more profit. We don't go to the cheapest dentist for our root canal treatment, do we? Well, uh, exactly, and we don't drive no. the cheapest car uh, or eat the well, cheapest food or go to the cheapest... No. But, you know, some but, people do, but you uh, don't want those as your customers. The other key thing here is that emotional hook as well. We are driven emotionally as well as rationally, aren't we? So we'll make those emotional decisions because of what that product does for me as well and i'm happy to pay that premium price well this is the crux of the matter because what people do the reason people feel like such furniture stores for instance is a classic example the reason they feel they need to sell on price is because they're we call it commoditized yeah meaning if i go to dfs or the bloke down the road or some of the i don't know what furniture stores there are it's not it's not something on my radar but you know if there's 20 different furniture chains out there well, they're all selling on price because, hey, it's just settees, it's just beds. Well, there's a place in the States where they sell um, mattresses, proper orthopedic mattresses, handmade, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for tens of thousands of dollars. Well, they do that because they're not selling mattresses. They're selling the outcome that this special mattress gives you. Exactly. Okay. So when you stop selling your thing, mm. and it doesn't matter whether it's legal services, window cleaning, rubbish replacement, car respraying, I surgery or whatever else you like to sell if you stop selling the thing yeah. and instead start selling the outcome the thing gives the person buying so the emotion my face 2020 vision the, the emotion it's, it's always emotion yeah. we, we always buy an emotion the mm. mri scanners tell us this yeah and it's been proven and you know, shown in the brain absolutely it's just recognizing the business that you're in the wider implication of it 
and meeting that need, oh, absolutely. that customer need. Well, somebody once said, people don't buy your products, they buy the product of your product. And it's as simple as that. Via the phone today, that's uh, John McCulloch, the evil ball genius. John's in Cork. Why did you decide to take yourself over to Cork then, John? We wanted to leave the UK for various reasons, my ex-wife being one of them, because she was just being impossible. Oh, dear. Uh, we, did, we thought about the States, because at the time, that's where all my work was, but then we figured there was, they were just a bunch of religious nutcases. Um, so we, we came here on, to Ireland, which has everything we want in terms of scenery, proximity to the coast, and all the rest of it. And the Guinness uh, came as well. for a week's holiday. We loved it here so much. We, we On the holiday, we just rented a place, and here we are. Okay, that was so 11 years ago, nearly. That was 11 years ago. Well, congratulations. I shall come over and visit you sometime, definitely. Apart from the weather, sounds great. <laughs> John. You obviously confess that your experience, you've been on the front line of business, so you've experienced business yep. as, as it is. Now, talking about finding the market for the higher end of your business, now you've obviously, with your inner circle of contacts, you've obviously got some case studies that, that have come out of changing this strategy. Can you tell us, give us some examples of clients that you've worked with that have been successful by making that change? Yeah, I mean, we've got a lady who's a copywriter. She just basically writes promotional copy for businesses. I mean, she went from, as she describes it in her own book, she went from scraping bottom to six figures in, in turnover, not profit, so, but her overheads are quite low. But she went from making barely 30 grand a year to making over 100,000 a year within six months just by mostly increasing her prices. And what that also does, that, that improves the way people in your market see you as well. So it's not just that the fact that you're getting higher prices, you're getting better customers and better clients and more of them. So there's the, there's the copywriter, there's the lady who deals in dental lab supplies. She runs a, a two-woman band, her and her assistant. Um, she sells the stuff to the labs that make the teeth a dentist puts into your mouth, implants and things. And she's more expensive than many of these big commercial suppliers who've got these massive catalogs and dozens of possibly hundreds of staff and she sells at higher prices than they do just because she knows how to position herself better. Because mm. she know, you know, the outcome that she can give is better than the outcome these big commercial labs can. Guys sell us promotional products to, to businesses. So, you know, you get these pens and coasters and mouse mats and things like that. Well, he does those kinds of things. And he's got thousands of different products. Well, he charges more than anyone else in his industry, yet he's one of the most successful ones in it. And he charges the most. So, uh, the, the printer in Watford, where there are 65 local competitors. And the average margin, he told me, this has gone back a few years now, was 15%. And his average margin was something like 55 to 60. And he's still one of the most popular printers there because he doesn't just print stuff on paper. He does full by marketing packages. And I, I could go on and on and on. Yeah, there's dozens of them. I mean, I don't sit down and make case studies of these things because that's not my mm. business. But I don't know anyone, to be fair. Oh, I tell you the best one. My personal trainer I started working with in 2016, bearing him on a 53, I've got a six pack and everything else. I started working with him and he now charges £6,000 upfront for a three month body transformation program. Yet you'll get so called the same thing mm. from people online on Facebook for £67 for the same three months, giving, promising the same things, the same diet, the same coaching, the same exercise regime changes and things, monitoring, check-ins every week. But he charges, what, 100 times more than she does almost for the same thing? But, yeah. but people pay it because of the outcome. There must also be that likability with the person as well. Well, I suppose so. I, I dare say that there are lots of people out there who don't like me very much. <laughs> <laughs> no, I... <laughs> John, let's quickly go back to our furniture store example. I mean, you clearly have uh, a disliking for people who sell things off cheaply but get the custom numbers through the door. The footfall is huge. What would you like to see businesses like that do then? Obviously, cut away from selling items cheaply and undercutting, you know, so many other outlets that sell better quality stuff at a higher price. What would your message to be to these cheaper furniture stores as an example? Well, my message to anyone... In, in that business or indeed any other business, to stop selling on price. How are you going it's to stop? your imagination. How will you stop that, though? How will you actually stop that furniture store having that continual year-long sale? Well, how would I advise them? To, mm. How would I advise them to stop doing it? Mm. But I'll just tell them to stop doing it. And instead of selling furniture, think of reasons, other reasons to differentiate them from all the other furniture sort of shops out there. 
And th- th- there could be loads of things. It, it could be the quality of their merchandise. It could be the quality of their service. It could be, you know, these places sell it cheap, but you don't get it for more than three months. We've got stuff in stock and you can have it immediately. Overnight delivery, if you like. Like those people selling the, the mattresses in the United States do, you can actually offer something that solves a specific problem rather than just a chair. As long as they okay. deliver on the promises, then... Oh, yeah, that's, that's the given. Yeah, I mean, if you're not delivering on your promises. But this, my point is this. All these furniture stores, which is a good, great example, by the way, and do you remember Queensway? Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I do. I, I know the jingle. What happened to them? Do you remember the jingle? There's no better way than Queensway. God, that dates you. Yeah, I know. There obviously was a better way because they went out of business. And they went out of business because while they had masses of cash flow, there was in that net, there was no profit. Sorry, in that growth, there was no net. And I've seen that happen loads of times. And it's always with low price sellers, people selling on price. The thing is, if your limit of your imagination to distinguish yourself from your competitors is... I sell it cheaper. Well, that's not very smart, okay? That doesn't show a lot for your imagination and your intelligence. And it doesn't say very much about your products and your services either. Anyone, even, and I know even lawyers, right, who cannot, they're not allowed to say we're a better lawyer than the lawyer down the road. It's the same with all healthcare professionals. They can't promise better class of treatment. But they can provide a better experience. For instance, if a lawyer says, if you're not seen within five minutes of your appointment, your appointment is free, well, that's a big differentiator from every other lawyer who keeps you waiting for half an hour in the waiting room. <laughs> Same with dentists. Yeah, I know. And, you know, you go to the dentist and he kept me waiting for 45 minutes. I was furious. I would have paid twice as much to get in when I was told I was going to be there. Sure. Mm. And then to walk out again. Sure. And bearing but in mind, we do pay for dental treatment yeah. in boxes over here. But again, private. it's getting into people's mindset, isn't it, The way about the way you think. You're not going to stop Mrs. Bloggs up the road going down to our furniture shop and picking up a three-seater sofa for, for 50 quid. Of course not. But then again, I don't, I don't want to serve everybody. I want to serve the people who will say yes to higher prices. Mm. And there are plenty of them. And the issues are, John, that actually... We're not very good at selling, are we, sometimes? <laughs> we're, yeah. we're appalling at selling. You know, the, uh, the very uh, fact we compete on price says we're not. Yeah, mm, exactly. It, it demonstrates how we don't have the skill base to actually position, close a sale at, at a premium price offer. The problem that comes down to this, we are, most of us, we are selling stuff. And if people can buy stuff cheaper elsewhere, they'll buy that stuff mm. cheaper elsewhere. Mm. And because you've not told them it's any different from the stuff down the road, which is cheaper, well, they'll go down the road and get it cheaper. Now, when I, I sell a high-end program, I don't, I've got a process for doing it. I don't get on the phone and say, well, it's cheaper than that bloke's over there. No. Well, it's not for a start. And I don't sell them an eight-week program, okay? What I sell them is an outcome at the end of the eight-week program, which is a robust business with a sales process and a marketing process in place itself in their business and how they can get higher priced or higher fee paying clients and customers at the end of it. That's what I'm selling. Yeah. And indeed, I'm not even selling that. I'm selling them what that money, mm. extra money gives them. More time off work, more time with the kids, more time with the family, mm. a chance to indulge their dreams without playing the double bass, having their own little carpentry thing in the barn or whatever. That's what I'm selling. I'm not selling my stuff. My stuff's irrelevant. I'm selling them a dream. Yeah. And as and long as I deliver on that, that's fine. And you have delivered on that. So you're, you've also got the results of, of that process that you can show people as well. Yeah, this is true. I mean, people will resist putting their prices up and they'll think of all kinds of objections and the fact is they're all wrong. Yeah. All right, John, if anybody wants more information about you and what you offer, where can we find it? They can find me at www.evilboardgenius.com and they can go from there and find out everything else they need to know by just following the simple on-screen instructions. But I will caution people, I'm, I'm not to everybody's taste, so <laughs> if they better have a, a thick skin. We've really enjoyed talking to you, John. Thank you so much for your time. We would like to call you again and, and uh, pick your brains on and perhaps another topic, if that's okay with you. Another furniture store. Yeah, I'm happy to do this whenever you like. <laughs> Thanks, John. Good to talk to you. All the best.